So hey, thank you for worshiping with us today. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Dan, and I get to serve as the groups and outreach pastor here at Genesis. And we are in week three of our study through the book of Exodus that we're calling the people of God. And over the last couple of weeks, in just the first two chapters, we've already seen God's amazing faithfulness on display to his one chosen family, the Israelites, as they suffer hardship after hardship in Egypt. And today, as we get into chapter three, we're going to learn more about God's character, but we're also going to learn about God's desire to use imperfect people to accomplish his perfect plans. But if we look at Exodus as a whole, like if we step back and use like a wide angle lens on this, we realize that the story of Exodus is the story of how God chose to act to redeem and set apart one family for himself. And I think we would all agree family is really, really important, right? Like the family you're a part of helps to build, develop, and establish both your values and your identity. And let me use myself as an example. I grew up with two parents who were both public servants. My dad was a cop and my mom was a teacher at my high school. And so this means that I got away with nothing <laughs> as a teenager. Um, but at home, it meant that I saw regularly uh, displayed the importance of serving and helping out others. But if I expand that out to just my aunts and uncles and their professions, well, then I have to add five more teachers, one more cop, an FBI agent, three nurses, a firefighter, a doctor, and one uncle who was in sales. And so as you can imagine, like, or as you hear, like, there's a lot of helping professions who are represented right there. And as you would imagine, most of our family get-togethers were really, really safe, except for that one time when the grill just burst into flames and the firefighter was nowhere around. It was amazing. It was an adventure to say the least. Um, but all that to say, the family that I grew up in, and just using myself as a case study here, has helped develop in me a high value in helping, serving, and even protecting others. But up to this point in the story, Moses didn't have this kind of stability. In fact, Pastor J.D. Greer says Exodus 3 opens with Moses as a pretty insecure man. And honestly, I think that's putting it a little lightly. Because if you remember his story, he grew up in Egypt and he had fled there 40 years before what we're about to read. And he'd been living as far away from Egypt as he possibly could on the far side of the desert. And that is the moment that God chose to introduce himself. So beginning in chapter 3, verse 1, the author writes, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire. It did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see why this strange sight, why the bush doesn't burn up. And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Now, if you've been around church for a while or any length of time, you've probably heard this story. And I'm going to be honest, there are loads and loads of layers to this story, and we're not going to get into all of them today. But there are a few things right off the bat that I think we need to pay attention to. And the first is that it was a fire that caught Moses' attention. And I think we can understand why, right? Like there's something about fire that kind of draws us in. That's why so many of us love to sit around a fire pit with people we care about. It's why we love to sit around a campfire or a bonfire or anything like that when the weather is nice and cool. Not when it's like 13 degrees, but when it's nice and cool out. Because fire is mesmerizing, but it's also comforting. But it's also something that's dangerous all at the same time. That's why we tell our kids, hey, don't play with fire. And it's throughout much of the Bible fire is often used to represent God's holiness. And that's really fitting because God is mesmerizing because we don't quite, we can't quite understand him. 
but he's comforting because he's so intimate with his followers. But at the same time, also like fire, he has to be taken seriously because of his holiness. And that's why God told Moses to stop and to take off his sandals, because the whole area where God had descended onto this mountain was holy. And I want to be clear, like there was nothing specifically special about that mountain before this day. Like it was just a normal mountain. And what made it holy is the fact that the God of the universe, the God of all creation, stepped into creation to meet Moses at this very moment. And that itself tells us something about God's character. It tells us that God is so holy, so different, and so set apart from creation that his presence naturally brings holiness. And in that holy setting, God does something very important for Moses because the next thing he says is to clarify Moses' identity as an Israelite. As we've already said, Moses has been living away from his hometown for 40 years. But think about his backstory for a second. He was a minority kid born into an oppressive setting. He ends up being raised in the home of those who were in power. And when he tried to intervene to save his own people twice, uh, they ended up ridiculing him. Then his adopted family tried to kill him, which forced him to flee across a desert where he married into a nomadic desert tribe. And now he's taking care of someone else's sheep. You add all that up and you get this guy, this 80-year-old guy who's got to be loaded with insecurity and identity issues. An Old Testament professor, Dr. Carmen Imes, suggests that when God said to Moses, I am the God of your father, and then added the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, God was essentially saying to Moses, look, Moses, you're not an Egyptian. You're not a Midianite. You're an Israelite. You're part of my chosen people. Moses, you are mine. And can you imagine how that must have felt to Moses to go from feeling like a man with no identity to someone whom God had chosen as his very own? And Moses' response to hearing that and seeing who God is is to hide his face because he found himself unexpectedly in the very presence of the one and only holy God. And look what God says next. I have seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their, <clears throat> because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And right after God cements Moses' identity as an Israelite, God confirms his own faithfulness to his people. You see, the Israelites had been in Egypt for about 400 years, and much of that time they had been oppressed and in slavery, to the point that there's no doubt that they wondered when or even if God would ever show up to rescue them. But I want you to, I want to pay attention to the verbs that God used here. Because look, he says, I have seen, I have heard, and I am concerned. And this isn't anything new. Exodus chapter 2 ends with these, very, with these very same verbs that God used to describe his awareness of what was going on. So clearly, God knew everything that was happening all along. But here's what we often miss in our English translations. Because most translations take a Hebrew word that's called yada, not yoda, yada, Y-A-D-A, that's in verse 7. And they translate it as concern, aware of, or to know about. But yada suggests a sense that God experienced their oppression for himself. That he felt their misery and their anguish as his very own. Not that he just knew what was going on. And this is really important for us to grasp because it reminds us of God's compassionate character and God's character does not change. Even when it seems like the world is spinning out of control, God still hears and knows the pain of the oppressed, the abused, the neglected, and the hurting. That's why the author of Psalm 34 says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted 
and saves those who are crushed in spirit. This is so much part, a part of God's character. He repeated that the cries of the Israelites had reached him and he had seen the way they were oppressed. And so as Moses stood there with his face covered, hearing the things that God was saying, I can't help but think that every memory from Moses' first 40 years in Egypt came rushing back to his mind. And that every emotion he experienced just flooded his heart all over again. And that's the moment when God introduced his plan. When he says, Moses, I want you to go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people out of Egypt. And Moses' reply is, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Now, that doesn't quite sound like the response I would expect. You know, we kind of expect this guy who twice tried to intervene for the Israelites to hear this and say, yeah, God, let's go. Let's go right now. Let's go get them out. But instead, Moses asks this question, says, why me? Like, what's so special about me that you want me to do this? And it kind of makes sense, right, that God would choose Moses. Like, he had all the qualifications, it seemed like. He grew up in the palace. He spoke the language, and he knew the customs. But God doesn't bring any of that up. Instead, God does actually something that's far better. Look at verse 12. God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. God completely sidesteps Moses' question and instead makes a promise that he will be with Moses. And what we're going to see over the course of the rest of this conversation is that God will continue to promise Moses that he will be with him. And that's a huge deal because God is basically saying to Moses, look, I'm calling you to do this. I'm going to be with you. That gives this plan a 100% chance of success. But Moses doesn't quite buy it, and he starts asking more questions. And each question revealed that his reluctance to go was born out of a low view of who God is. Now, to clarify, a low view is when we see God for far less than he is. It's when we limit him, limit him and his ability to work by our understandings or by our own inabilities. A high view of God, on the other hand, is... <clears throat> Oops, sorry, out of place, uh, is when we accept the truth that God is so far beyond what we can understand. It's when we realize that he's not bound by any limitations or by any weakness. And Moses' very next question, he says, all right, God, suppose I do go. Suppose I go to the Israelites. I'm like, hey, look, the God of our ancestors, he sent me to, to get you out of here. Uh, who should I tell him that you are? And it's not like Moses is asking God, like, hey, what's your name? Um, he's asking for a greater understanding of his character. He's asking for a clarity on who God is. But again, God doesn't just answer the question directly. It's not like God goes, oh, Moses, I'm sorry. I was so excited to talk to you about this that I forgot to introduce myself. I'm, I'm God. No, like it's not what he does. God confirms and describes his unchanging character. And this is where we get this kind of confusing and kind of awe-inspiring name that God gives himself, I am. Because in verse 14, God says, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And so in response to Moses' question about his character, God said, I am who I've always been, and I have always been who I will be. Does that make sense to anybody else? Because like, it's a little puzzling. And if I think about this for too long, I start to get a headache because I just start going in philosophical circles and it just doesn't make any sense to me. And so somebody much smarter than me, Christopher Wright, who is an Old Testament scholar, had this to say about it. He said, for whatever else we read into the divine statement, I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. This is the first thing God declares that he is and will be. Namely, I will be with you. This is the God who will be as present with Moses in all the twists and turns of the story yet to come as he is present with him now in a flaming bush. And so two questions in. Moses gets the same promise in response. Moses, I'm with you. You can trust me. And even though Moses continues to press God, he starts asking like, okay, well, what if they don't believe that you're the one who sent me? At which point God gives Moses something a little more tangible to grab onto, literally. 
seeing that Moses is holding a staff, God says, hey, take that staff you're holding and throw it on the ground and just watch what happens. So Moses throws his staff on the ground and it turns into a snake. And according to chapter four, verse three, Moses runs away. I mean, who can blame him? right? Like you just saw a staff turn into a snake. That's probably pretty dangerous. I'm going to do the same thing and don't try to hide it. You know, you would too. All right. And so he runs away from the snake. I just saw somebody shaking their head. Yes. Thank you for agreeing with me. Um, But here's the thing. God gets him to come back. And then he says, Hey, grab that snake by the tail. Now I'm going to be honest. I haven't done a lot of snake catching in my life. Um, but when I read this, it makes it like two questions come to mind. And the first one is like, at what point on a snake does it become its tail? Like there's no clear distinction like there is on my dog, right? Like it's, is it head, body, tail? Is it head, neck, tail? Is it just head, then tail? Like I need some kind of clarification on this. And the second question is like, why grab it by the tail? Because you know this thing's just gonna whip around and bite you. But the crazy thing is that Moses trusted God enough to reach out and grab this snake by the tail. And it seems like this is a moment in the story where it's starting to shift and Moses is starting to trust God. That is until God says, hey, for another one of these signs, you're actually going to need to be in Egypt for it to happen. And at the thought of heading back to the country he fled 40 years before, Moses pulls out this excuse that he doesn't speak well. Now, loads of scholars and people and pastors think uh, lots of different things about what Moses actually meant. And honestly, we can't really know what he meant by that. But what we can tell from the text is that Moses was using his, quote unquote, inability to speak as an excuse to try to get out of going back to Egypt. Because this sounds kind of like a crazy dream, right? Like Moses just saw this staff that he's had probably for years get turned into a snake and then back into a staff all while he's talking to this bush that's on fire, but, but not actually burning up. It doesn't seem like it would be much of a stretch for God to help him speak well. And that's kind of what God says to him. Look at verse 11. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and teach you what to say. Now, it's pretty easy for us to read that with a a tone of frustration, especially if you're a parent, right? Because this sounds like a conversation where you ask one of your kids to do something, you know, literally a thousand times and they just don't do it. They come up with excuse after excuse. Oh, I forgot. I just don't want to do it. And like, that's what this sounds like to me. But maybe that's just because I have a preteen. Um, But that was Moses' endgame when we see this happening again and again. He was seemingly content to watch his father-in-law's sheep and just kind of drive them all over the desert looking for whatever grass and water they could find. But the thing is, God had a very different flock in mind for Moses to shepherd through the desert. And so when Moses' growing reluctance meets God's decided plan, God again promises that he will be with Moses. And this time God gets really specific because what the NIV is translated as, I will help you speak, is quite literally translated as, I will be with your mouth. So what we need to understand as we see this conversation playing out is that God is ascending God. He's called Moses out of life in the desert to a very specific task, to go and be used to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. And what we need to wrestle with is that God is still ascending God because his character does not change. And I think if we sit for a while with that idea that God is ascending God, it can make some of us, if not all of us, a little bit nervous because we love the idea that God has saved us from our sins. We love that he promises to be with us and that he's for us. But the fact of the matter is God has not saved us just so we can go to heaven when we die. God saves with an intent to send. Now, that doesn't mean that he's calling every person to go into full-time church ministry or to become a missionary to another country. It does mean that for some, but it doesn't mean that for everyone. What it does mean for every follower is that you are called to reflect his character and to make disciples wherever he calls you or where he already has you. 
And that can seem a little daunting, right? To think about the fact that God wants to use me to show someone else who I may or may not already know what he's like, to disciple that person, to, to model Christ to that person. And it could be a family member, a coworker, a neighbor, a teammate, a friend, somebody you regular, regularly see at the gym, or even a waiter or waitress that you see frequently at your favorite restaurant. And as we think about this, it forces us to wrestle with the question, do I have a low view of God? Do I think God's ability to accomplish his plan hinges solely on my abilities? Or do I have a high view of God? Do I trust God enough to accomplish his plan despite my inadequacies, my weaknesses, and my past? That was the question that Moses was confronted with at the burning bush. In verse 13, we get his answer. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. And so finally, Moses just comes right out and says it. Look, I don't want to do this. I don't trust you enough to go back. And throughout this conversation, Moses, Moses has made it pretty clear that he's saying no because he has a low view of God. And that day at the bush, he didn't trust that God would be with him. And he didn't trust that God would follow through. And when he finally admitted this, uh, verse 14 says that God's anger burned against Moses. You see, from the moment that God confirmed Moses' identity as part of his chosen people, God had been trying to get Moses to understand that the promise of God's presence supersedes any weakness. And when you look back across this conversation, it doesn't seem like God is trying to convince Moses to go it seems like God was trying to get Moses to understand um, that he needed to surrender his heart, to let go of his baggage, and to embrace a loving relationship with Yahweh, the God who always has been and always will be. And the same goes for all of us. God doesn't save us just so we can go to heaven. He brings us to life in Christ so that we can participate in his plan for creation. Look, participating in God's plan is not about doing more. It's about trust and it's about obedience. And the way we grow in trust is by developing a high view of God and growing and developing a low view of self. And that doesn't mean like we develop a low view of ourselves in the sense of low self-esteem or not in the sense of little to no value. It means developing a low sense of ourself in relation to God. It means uh, submitting in humility to the God who graciously uses imperfect people to accomplish his perfect plans. Because you see, God is not looking for perfect partners who have it all together. Moses certainly didn't have it all together. What God desires are partners who have fully surrendered their hearts to him. And a fully surrendered heart leads to a higher view and a greater appreciation of God and his unchanging character. And the natural byproduct of a higher view of God is greater trust in who he is and a growing desire to be obedient to what he asks. Now look, the likelihood of God calling any one of us in this room to be the sole leader to liberate millions of people from slavery is pretty low. But if you're a follower of Jesus, he has already called you to make disciples. So the question you need to ask yourself is, do I trust God enough to work in spite of my weaknesses? And this doesn't mean you have to do something dramatic. It just means that you have to be faithful and trust that God loves to use imperfect people. And if you and I will do that, we will see opportunities for God to work at every single turn. The size of the task isn't what matters. What matters is a surrendered heart plus the presence of God. And that's what led one student from this campus to start a Bible study for their teammates. It's what led a CPA in our church to use his knowledge and his expertise of the tax system to serve, and care, to serve um, low-income families in Indianapolis, voluntarily giving up his Saturdays to do that. It's why some of you have decided to foster or adopt children. 
And it's why some of you have said yes to serving in Gen Kids, GSM, being a group leader or in any other area of our church. Because anything done with a surrendered heart and God's presence will always bring him glory and will always be worth it. Over the last few months, uh, the end, what Jesus says at the end of Matthew's gospel has been stirring in me personally quite a bit. Because in Matthew chapter 28, we read about a different conversation on a different mountain that's equally as important. Matthew writes, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they, were, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And listen to this. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. At the burning bush, Moses stood on holy ground in God's presence, and he doubted God's ability to use him, and he questioned God's character to follow through on his promise. Matthew writes about another burning bush moment after Jesus' resurrection. Some of Jesus' disciples met him on a mountain that was also made holy by his presence, and they worshiped him there. But like Moses, some of them doubted. And Jesus finished his commission with the same words God said to Moses, I am with you. But this time, this time he clarified the unending duration of that promise that God made to Moses. And that moment with Jesus was not just for those who stood there. It was for all who would come to find life in Christ and to trust him enough to participate in his plan for his creation. And the same God that promised Moses he would walk with him into Egypt has promised that he will walk with each and every one of us. And that promise is forever complete through the presence of of the Holy Spirit living in every follower of Jesus who has surrendered their heart to God. I don't know what's kind of stirring in you right now. Maybe as we've talked about this, there's a, there's a, a name or a face that's kind of come to mind. Or maybe you're sitting there asking, God, I don't know how you could use me. If I can be honest with you for just a second, um, I'm a little off script here. Um, this was never my plan. Never once did it was being a pastor my plan. I had something entirely different in mind. But 23 years ago, when I was 16, God showed up and said, hey, that's a great plan for someone else. This is what I want you to do. It's a moment that is forever burned in my mind. And he reminds me of it frequently when I start asking the same question that Moses asked. Why me? Why am I so special? Why are you asking me to do this thing that seems so hard? Because when he calls you, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It doesn't mean you're going to get it right every single time. But if you'll say, God, here I am, and here's my heart, he's made it clear that his promise is that he will be with you now and for all of eternity. And if we can live that way, we will certainly find the abundant life that Jesus has promised. A life of seeing him on the move, a life experiencing the Holy Spirit flowing through us to bring God glory, to reflect his character into creation. Will you pray with me? Faithful God, Yahweh, God who is 